Scott Caldwell, WFR live stream. We are in our next to last lesson in Christians, Commands, and Grace. So this is a very practical lesson that everybody needs because it goes through a very comprehensive summary of the various categories of teaching and commands for Christians to guide us and how to love God and love people. And that's something we all need. Let's begin with a prayer and we'll go ahead and get started. Well, Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just love you and pray that we'll love you with the same heart you love us with. We just pray we'll respond to your love with faith, with commitment, being faithful to Christ, uh, striving to think and act in line with your commands, representing your image in this world. We can only do it with the help of your spirit, and we pray for the help of your spirit. We pray you'll uh, be with us as we look at your word tonight. Just help us to appreciate it, to see how it speaks to us and how we should live in our day-to-day uh, interactions and relationships, and just pray it'll draw us closer to you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been going through this summary of various commands and teachings. Uh, first, positive commands, telling us here's how God wants us to live and act. Then we got into the restrictive ones, telling us how not to, because you need those restrictions to draw the line on what God means by what he says. They're very helpful. We're still in those restrictive commands right now. That's where we're going to continue on, although we will actually finish those and go to a, a, a different point here of discussion uh, later in this lesson. So here's where we shall begin. Commands that discuss how not to interact with others. Don't give in to anger. How's that for a, a practical one? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. He would like to have a foothold. Just don't give him one. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. So while there is such a thing as righteous anger, any anger can quickly become excessive. Anger can cause our lives to spiral out of control and result in us doing and saying things that can plague our relationships with others even after we apologize. And we've all seen this happen. Men are often quick to respond with anger and to interpret any difference of opinion as a direct attack or an intentional act of disrespect. I'm speaking, speaking partly from personal experience as a man and Men, I've been around observed. We can maybe say this is one of those testosterone things, aggression kind of things, and it often comes out this way in men, but it should not. Those who deal with us should not have to feel like they're walking in a field of landmines because they never know when we'll blow up over something. And I bet many of y'all would say there's times that that's exactly how you felt around people. That's the opposite of demonstrating the attitude of Christ. So any issue that can be addressed with anger can also be dealt with through a calm and peaceful discussion. And we've all seen it many times. I've seen times where it may have been on TV or in an actual conversation I saw where someone was responding to something that was very irritating and they just very quietly and calmly had a discussion and dealt with it. And I remember times thinking, well, you know, I might got a little attitude there and look at how that person did it. They dealt with the problem adequately but did it without getting mad, without getting angry, without attacking, I think. All right. They can do it. I can do it. I need to learn from them. Another category. Don't harm others or commit murder. The commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Christians are to demonstrate love to other people, even if those people disagree with us or mistreat us. Regardless of how strongly we disagree with others' morals or their lifestyles, we're not to hate them, harm them, or condone such actions by others. Instead, we should strive to protect them from those who would harm them. The ultimate form of hatred is murder, and the most common form is abortion, often the, the, the most missed form. We'll talk about that one later. It involves ending the life of a child before the child is born. 
Now let's really get practical. Don't engage in crude talk or cursing. I think some Christians would be surprised to know there's verses about this. Here's a verse, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. I had two more verses here, well, maybe three. Let, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Well, that's pretty plain, isn't it? Their religion is worthless. Yeah, but what? I, but I go to church, I do good things, but you curse up and down like a satyr. Well, the Bible says your religion is worthless. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So, where does this cursing come from when it comes? According to the Bible, it's coming from the heart. Just because something is funny or cool, it doesn't mean a Christian should say it, does it? Rude and crude talk will not come out of our mouths unless, unless such rudeness and crudeness are first in our hearts. Now, someone could say, well, you know, I'm actually trying to stop this, you know, and uh, but it's kind of like I got trained in doing it. It's like an automatic thing. Okay, let's think about that. Well, just as we trained ourselves to routinely use rude and crude phrases, we can retrain ourselves to automatically respond with God-honoring phrases. So, sure enough, things do become habits, and you get used to it, and it can be kind of automatic. Well, okay, we just need to work on coming up with some better automatic things. So, maybe instead of God, blankety blank, blah, 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 it's God is great. God is good. Thank you, Lord. Children of Israel. Uh, Land of Goshen, children of Israel. That actually, actually used to be a response out here people give. There's a lot of good phrases someone can throw out and make an automatic thing if we just repeat them over and over. Here's one directly from Christ. Don't be hypercritical of others. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you used, it will be measured to you. Well, Christ was addressing the issue of being hypercritical in our dealings with others. It's easy to criticize and pick people apart but that's not the way of Christ. Many mistakenly take this to mean we should never judge evil in our own lives, the lives of others, or in society. Well, that viewpoint is contradicted by many verses, as we've seen in this study, because we looked at a few. Christ also said, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. While Christ said not to be overly critical of people, he also said to judge between right and wrong, good and evil, and to confront sinful Christians with their sin. It's not possible to live godly lives if we're not able to judge between right and wrong. So there's a right time of type of judgment. There's a wrong type of judgment being hypercritical. Another category here. Don't pay back evil for evil. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. And one more verse. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Well, as tempting as it might be to physically and verbally put evil people in their place, and it is tempting sometimes, that's the opposite of our calling as followers of Christ. We should leave justice to God and the legal system while we respond with good deeds, forgiveness, and kindly spoken words of truth. That's not to say we shouldn't get engaged if needed to help protect the innocent, but just as far as getting back with someone and making a comment, we're, we're not to trade smart comments. We're supposed to reflect Christ. We're the ones who said we're following Christ. They didn't. So then we're jumping to another 
section here. Now we're going to commands concerning how not to interact with Christians. So we're not just talking people in general, but Christians. Don't be a stumbling block to fellow Christians. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So the judgment referred to in this case had to do with some Christians looking down on other Christians whose conscience, consciences would not allow them to engage in some cultural practices that were not immoral or sinful. So we kind of have to know the background of what's going on here. This is one we actually alluded to in the positive commands at one point. In the first century, it was common for leftover food that had been sacrificed to idols in pagan ceremonies to be sold in the general marketplace. So you see, this is just a completely different thing that wouldn't happen really in our culture. So sometimes you go to the market to buy meat. That meat had been sacrificed over here in this pagan temple, but now it's over here in the market. The Apostle Paul noted it was okay to eat this meat as long as you did not participate in the idol worshiping ceremony and it did not bother your conscience. In the book of Revelation, Christ will often attack those who eat meat sacrificed to idols, but it was always in the context of they were participating in the idol worshiping ceremony. That's why it was automatically forbidden in those contexts. So it did go against some Christians' consciences to eat this meat. And at times, they were being pressured by other Christians to do it anyway. And that brings up this verse. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. So we must be careful that our actions do not cause others to be led into sinful conduct or behaviors that go against their consciences because of our example. If we had the attitude of Christ, we will be more concerned about any way in which we might influence others to do wrong or cause division in the church than we will be determined to exercise our rights. So Paul the Apostle outright said there's a, a truth here. There's a right and a wrong. He said it was okay to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols, sold in the marketplace, as long as you had nothing to do with any ceremony or involved in worshiping the idol. And even then, some Christians had a conscience that just wouldn't let them do it. And Paul said, well, okay, that's fine. Well, don't do it if it bothers your conscience. But he also told Christians who were bugging them to go ahead and do it anyway, he said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Don't tell people to go against their conscience here. You know, have some respect for them. Don't become a stumbling block for them. Another category, don't enable fellow Christians to continue in their sins and temptations. This is one you don't hear much in our present day, but would apply. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For even when we were with you, we would give this, you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage and the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Well, that's not something you hear much discussed today. Here's another verse. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. For to keep away from able-bodied Christians who could work, but refuse to do so, and instead expect others to support them. We're not talking about the disabled. We're talking about people who would like to work but can't work, right? Instead of supporting them, church members should keep away from them if they refuse to change. So this apparently was becoming a thing, at least, uh, here we talked about in Thessalonica as he's talking to them. And it's debated some what was going on. Were, were they say they think the Lord's just about to come back, so they didn't see any need to work, you know, or where they just thought it was more spiritual to go around house to house talking and go to the different Christian gatherings and eat their food. Paul didn't get into the details, but he says, you're able-bodied, you're supposed to be out working to make something to support yourself and to support others and do that. And if they're just over here, he would more or less say mooching off of the Christians, he'd say they could work and they refuse to, well, then, then, then don't let them eat. So there's a very a direct comment made we need to think about. 
So instead of supporting them, church members should keep away from them if they refuse to change. We should never help people in a way that enables and motivates them to continue in sinful or foolish practices. There is a time to help people and a time to let them suffer the consequences of their actions so they can learn and be motivated to do better. So it often depends on what you're talking about here, but in his case, they can work, they should work, they need to work, and so let's help motivate them, let them quit eating at your Christian gatherings and give them a little motivation here. And we can often see this, especially in cases like addiction. Someone has an addiction, to the degree you, you help them through all their problems so they don't suffer the consequences, they may never change because they're suffering no consequences. To the degree you let them suffer their consequences, then as they are willing to get help, sure, you're in there and willing to help them. But this is a principle they even use in the halfway houses. And so uh, there's a way to help people and a time to help people. And there's a way and time not to do for people what they want you to do. Let's look at another category. Don't treat fellow Christians disrespectfully. Do not rebuke an older man harshly. Be kind to me. <laughs> but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Well, we should treat all people, especially Christians, with proper respect. There's no place for cockiness or rudeness in our dealings with fellow Christians, regardless of differences in age, gender, education, or economic standing. I'm proud to say at our congregation, I don't ever see any of that happen, but still it's a thing that comes from human nature. We have to keep our eyes on it. Now we're switching here in the categories of restrictive commands to commands that relate to other behaviors that we're to avoid. This, this is kind of the general category where everything else will fit in. Don't try to impress people by how you serve God. Christ is going to have a lot to say about this. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward, will reward you. Now, we can appreciate different ways this might come out, and we've probably seen it at times. Their situation was a little different then. So the Pharisees, of course, they wore a particular clothing that made them recognized as Pharisees. And they had certain times of day, even in public, when people would stop and pray. So the Pharisees, some of them, will go out of their way to make sure they're on the main street corner at the time of prayer, so when they stop and raise their hands and pray to God, everyone can look at them and go, oh my goodness, that man is just so religious and spiritual. I wish I'd just like him. And Jesus is saying, if your goal is to impress people, then that's all you did. You impress people. You didn't impress God. <laughs> he wouldn't impress with it. You're doing it to the wrong person for the wrong reason. So now, that's not to say you're not out there doing good works and someone can see you doing them, but they may see you doing them. You're out there with people. But if your goal is to do the right thing to help someone, well, great. That's the reason, not how can I get the most attention, kind of like we think of politicians looking for that PR moment where I can get the most attention. Did everybody see what I just did? You know, that kind of thing. Another verse. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. Now, if a person wants to fast out of commitment to God, spiritual reasons, that's grace. <laughs> but you don't put on special clothes or bust up your hair or do something to make sure everybody knows you're doing that because really you were just doing it for their attention. These are some points Christ made in the Sermon on the Mount. We must serve God from sincere hearts that desire to please Him. If we do things for the express purpose of impressing people, then we're not really doing it out of a heart for God, and He is neither pleased nor honored by our actions. We need to make sure our good deeds are done for the right reason. Both honest, sincere Christians understand this quite well. Here's a good practical one, one I need to be reminded of. Don't get caught up in a cycle of worry. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. One person I saw describe worrying as praying for what you don't want. And, and I can kind of see that. <laughs> we should distinguish between an unhelpful anxiety over the uncertainties of life and a healthy concern that makes plans and takes action to improve the situation. While Paul said not to be anxious about anything, he also discussed the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. So Paul said, don't be anxious, but he did say, I've got a bunch of pressure on me concerned for the spiritual wel welfare of the churches. But Paul didn't get overwhelmed by the problems in the churches. He prayed for them. He sent them letters of encouragement, and he did what he could to help them grow in faith. He took positive action. For things we can't control, we need to pray, put them in God's hands, and keep serving Him. For those matters we have some control over, we should pray to God, put it in His hands, keep serving Him, and do what we can to improve the situation. So, we always, as Peter said, you know, in tough times and times of persecution, he said, entrust yourselves to God and continue in good works. When in doubt, entrust yourself to God and continue doing good. That's always true. Then, we're always going to be looking for, okay, and what practical things can I do to help in this situation to make things better? And, uh, but we don't need to become so overwhelmed. We're just, you know, can't think, we can't act, can't do anything. Have some faith in God and you're on the earth to serve God and represent his image. So go forth doing that. All right, let's, uh, let's allow you to unmute, see if anyone has a question. So who has a question for me? <clears throat> Scott, I don't say have a question, but I, uh, the opening comments you were making about loving others, uh, uh, my mantra as I go forward is to improve on this love thing, but to make those enemies my friends. That's a scripture, you know, with God can help me to do that. That's what I'm keeping before me. Well, that's a beautiful uh, thing, because if you make your enemy your friend, they're not your enemy anymore, are they? <laughs> that's right. So and, uh, I, God says I can do it, so I'm just going to trust him and try my best. Mm -hmm. We try to figure it all out, and of course, there's most of it all we can't figure out, but we know what the Lord wants us to do. Well, fine, I'll do that, and I'll trust the Lord to work through it to do good, but that's, that's a beautiful sentiment. Thanks, Betty. Yeah, I like the... Uh fact that when Jesus gave the two greatest commandments, uh, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then later on in John, he upgraded that last part to love your neighbor as Christ has loved you, as, as, as I have loved you, which really puts a new dimension onto it. Yeah, that does take it to a, a, a higher level. Uh, it means that we all need to be, uh, Think a little harder, trying a little harder on this. And it does why it also takes, we need to be reminded of all of this because so much goes up on, in life and often, uh, especially if we're dealing with some issue, we, we our first response is to react back to the issue instead of saying, okay, how would Christ react in this situation? How do I, how do I need to react? So thanks, Keith, uh, excellent point. Uh, I'm gonna- Scott, to there was a, another phrase that was used. Uh, it was talking about, demonstrating love you know toward those that mistreat us mm -hmm. so it has to be a demonstration it can't just be a thought in my head you know well that's right and, and you know and you sure can't make it a feeling because feelings come and go and you can't will the feeling i may not be having this warm fuzzy feeling about this person especially if they're being a pain but i can still be nice and demonstrate love toward them regardless of my feeling All right, I'm going to mute us again because we got some more to cover. Let's talk about the problem of some serious false doctrine. Don't tolerate false teachers or false doctrine. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. 
If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. How about that? For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. So this is kind of getting into some of this, this the second John, some of this Gnostic philosophy was coming around. Some were denying Jesus was God. Some were denying he had a body of flesh. Either way, we're denying Jesus is God in the flesh. That's a important fundamental matter of salvation. Uh, you're not going to tolerate this. And you're not going to have anything to do with it. Another verse. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert. Now listen, look at this phrase. Who pervert the grace of our Lord into sensuality. Pervert the grace of our, our God into sensuality. And deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Perverting the grace of God into sensuality means to teach that you can practice a lifestyle of sinfulness, and it doesn't matter because it's all covered by grace. That's what that means. So this is a very common thing with false teachers. It's a very common thing today with false teachers. Go on YouTube and you see it. And so it kind of gets into this, you know, God loves us and the grace of Christ. And so, you know, so what if you participate this sin, that sin, the other sin, Christ is so loving and merciful, it's all good. Well, that's what these guys were teaching that John is dealing with very strongly here. So uh, notice how strongly the Bible discusses that. It's called perverting the grace of God into sensuality. Doctrines that are essential to salvation are more important than those that are not. Fundamental matters that relate to salvation are centered on the gospel of Christ. These include there's one God, our sin separates us from God, Jesus is God in the flesh. He died on the cross for our sins. He conquered death and his body rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven where he now rules. He will return to be a resurrection and judgment of all. Along with that are the teachings that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. And living faithful to him requires a repentant heart that strives to live morally and think and act in line with his commands. One other verse, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed when you start perverting and twisting fundamental issues of salvation relating to the gospel. It is a terribly serious matter. The Bible speaks very strongly against false teachers who twist these essential doctrines or who approve of immoral lifestyles. Those who teach false doctrines concerning these fundamental issues are to be strongly rebuked and denounced. They're not to be received as a brother or given fellowship. That's just how strongly the Bible speaks on these things. This is spiritual life and death issues you're talking about. You can't be wishy-washy about it. And uh, a different type of problem with teaching. Don't get caught up in unimportant teachings. Instead, keep the focus on Christ and living a godly life. Paul will say, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, but rather, train yourself to be godly. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You, make, you may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. Well, this issue he's talking about here did not involve twisting fundamental issues relating to salvation, but causing division and taking the focus away from Christ and living a godly lifestyle. And so a lot of these were getting called up in some little nitpicky thing of something in the Old Testament law, and, and they may have even been correct what they're saying. But even if you get focused on some little unimportant thing and you make it a big thing and it becomes such a big thing, you're putting the focus on it instead of Christ, and the gospel, and living a godly life in Christ, then you're pushing those important things aside and just making room for your unimportant thing and causing division. And Paul says, no, we're not going to do that because that's taking the focus off of Christ. Those who dwell on arguments and quarrels about insignificant matters should be told to cease. If they won't stop, we should, have, should not have anything to do with them. Our focus must always be on Christ as our Lord, our God, our Savior, our High Priest, our Mediator, and our Sacrifice for Sins. So 
humans have the tendency of getting off track. And in Colossians, you know, Paul will talk about those who get called up and they're constantly talking about some dream or idea they had and practically get called up in worshiping angels. And he's saying, this is a bunch of nonsense. You put the focus on Christ as Lord and living a godly life following him. We don't go on and on about that other mess. Plus much of that stuff, they were just things they're making up. So even though we're not talking about here, people twisting fundamental issues of salvation, they were putting so much issue, emphasis on something that was meaningless or unimportant that you were taking away the emphasis on the things that are important. Here's a practical one. Don't quit assembling with other Christians. And let us not give up meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing this. Instead, let us encourage one another with words of hope. Christians are commanded by Christ to get together with one another so we can study the Bible and build up each other spiritually. It's not just about the benefits we get from assembling with other Christians, but how we can bless and encourage them. It's not just what I get out of it. How can I encourage someone else? The Bible does not present the concept of living as a solitary Christian who intentionally secludes themselves from other Christians as a valid option. The Bible never says, go assemble with other Christians or not, just go off and be alone by yourself with God and do that. That's just never presented as an option. A love for Christ and his people should draw Christians together. If a Christian never assembles with other Christians, a good question would be whether Jesus is really their Lord. If he's their Lord, why are they not doing what he said to do? Because he said to assemble with other Christians. Now, that's not to say there's not ex no extenuating circumstances, because there are in sickness and pandemics and special events and vacations and such that may temporarily, temporarily keep Christians from connecting with one another. We're talking about someone, and I've run across these people who just say, you know, all those churches are off track, and me and God, we get along over here under this tree. And I'm saying, well, you know, Christ told you to go assemble with other Christians. He said, well, you know, all these churches are off track. I said, really? All of those churches are off track. And, and you're the only one on track. I said, well, then you got a mission. You need to go get those people on track, man. <laughs> you're the only one left, apparently. So usually when people get into this, they're getting a little twisted in their thinking. But we just pay attention to what Christ said to do. He said, go do it because he's the Lord. Well, then fine, let's do it. Don't let money or things become your God. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is an exchange for your work and labor and is not evil in itself. It is the love of money that becomes the problem. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Notice he didn't condemn them for working and making money, but, you know, God's giving you this blessing. Use it to serve him. The Bible never condemns people for making money by providing good and honest services to others, even if they get rich in the process. Generally, we all need to work to make money to live, bless our families, and be able to help others. But work and money and things should never be what is most important in our lives. If money comes between God and us, it becomes our God. And we all can kind of appreciate the problem, something that you need. You know, it's easy to get off focus and put too much emphasis on it. Here's a verse from Hebrews. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or, nor forsake you. We need to have faith in God to help us provide for our needs while realizing our needs are much less than our wants. Being financially blessed means God has given you the gift of generosity. Those who have a surplus of money have the responsibility for being financially generous and supporting the work of the kingdom. So if you've worked hard and God's blessed you and you have a lot, well, great. You can give more than most in helping the work of the kingdom. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. We store up treasure in heaven by what we give to help others and advance Christ's kingdom, not by what we keep or only use for ourselves. So, 
what blessing God gives us, whether it's time or talent or money, we need to be using it to serve him. So we've now finished up our summary of positive and restrictive commands. We, we've gone through a good representative summary of the different categories of the positive restrictive commands. So here's our summary. Taken together, all these commands, we went over here in the last three lessons and, and in this one, all these commands define how to show love for God and people. We're to love God and love people, but it's the commands that give the details of what God means by that. That's why we looked at them. When combined, they guide us in how to walk in the light and live faithful to Christ. What should we do if we realize we've sinned and failed to follow Christ's commands? I could appreciate many people, especially young Christians, saying, whoa, you know, I wasn't really familiar with a lot of those things. <laughs> and I see I was doing some things I wasn't supposed to do. Well, what do I do now? Well, the proper response when a Christian gets off track spiritually is always to repent, confess our sin to God, confess our sin to people, make any amends necessary, accept God's forgiveness, and go forward doing better. That's what you do. God will always forgive those Christians who repent and begin following his commands again. So now we're, we're moving to a different section. We've covered all these commands and had a look at them. Now we're going to discuss them a little and talk a little bit more about discussions people have about them. What are some arguments Christians have used to justify sinful lifestyles? And, and there's many going on today, I see and I hear. So up until now, we've been having biblical discussions as we look to see what the Bible teaches concerning how we should live to honor Christ. We've only been looking at the Bible. These biblical teachings are the only factors that should matter for Christians because they communicate God's will for us. So, and honestly, what we've looked at and what God says about it, that's really all any of us need to know. Other arguments are sometimes given or questions are asked that have nothing to do with the Bible, but may seem to make valid or logical points. At times, alternate interpretations of Bible verses are advanced as well. Because many of these arguments are well known and often influence even Christians, well, it's helpful to compare them to Scripture. So it's, it's worth looking at them and thinking about them. So here's one that often comes up. Once a Christian is saved, aren't they always saved? So we're looking at the different challenges people might get after you go over these verses and say, well, yeah, yeah, that's what the Bible says, but... Does it really matter because of this reason, that reason, the other reason? And, and so these are things that are brought up. So here's one that's brought up. Well, what about this once saved, always saved? Some assert that once a person becomes a Christian, they can never fall away from their saved status, no matter what they do or how they live, live like the devil. They would say it doesn't matter because you're in Christ and you're forgiven no matter what. Based on that, it's sometimes argued that Christians could live sinfully but would still go to heaven. So what does it matter if they live lives of sinfulness? Well, someone might say, well, just be quiet and quit bothering everybody with all these commands. It doesn't matter. They're still going to heaven anyway, because once they'd always say. Not so long ago, I was talking to someone who got back called up in drugs and alcohol, and they said, well, you know, I know it doesn't affect my salvation, but, you know, it does mess up your life here some. So, you know, maybe I should do something, make my life better. But I know it has nothing to do with my salvation, I said. Oh, but I believe it does. Let's talk about it. And uh, the person finally did something just because they want to make their life better. But, you know, if you can appreciate my salvation is connected to how I'm living and to what degree I'm ignoring God's commands, maybe we'll be, we'll be a little more serious about it. So the belief of once saved, always saved is often based on these verses. There's a few, but this is a common one. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Christ is speaking. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So it's true that no one, including the devil, can force people away from Christ and cause them to lose their salvation. But that does not address the fact that Christians can quit believing and repenting and begin to live consistent lives of sin that cause them to become divorced from Christ and his blessings. No, the devil can't take you away from the Lord, but you can, is the problem. Many verses make it quite clear that Christians can turn away from following Christ and lose their salvation. Let's look at a couple of them. Paul in Galatians says, You who are trying to be justified by the law 
have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Well, you get the impression someone could fall away from grace because he told them they have fallen away from grace. Here in Timothy, Paul said, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If you want to deny Christ and turn your back on him, expect for him to deny you as one of his at the judgment. There are many if statements in the Bible that discuss what will happen if we take certain actions and likewise, what will happen if we don't. There's one in 1 Corinthians 15 where it gets to discussing the gospel. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you're being saved. We're saved by the gospel. If, there's that word if, you're saved by the gospel, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul notes that we're saved by the gospel of Christ if we hold fast to it and continue to follow Christ. If we don't continue to follow him, our initial belief's in vain. It's of no value. Paul shared a list of sins with the Christians in Corinth and told them, quote, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's talking to Christians concerning them inheriting the kingdom of God. If we keep quit believing in Christ and deny him, whether by our words or our actions, the consequence is that we cut ourselves off from him and his forgiveness. Because of the seriousness of the consequences, Christians should be warned if they're fooling themselves into thinking they're right with God while living according to the sinful ways of the world. There's no spiritual loophole that allows a Christian to participate in a lifestyle of sin and refuse to repent, but still enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not the way the covenant of Christ is set up, and there's verse after verse that discusses this. Well, another question someone might bring up in all this is they say, well, yeah, I see these commands, but I don't think they really matter for this reason. So some would say, well, aren't we called to be grace Christians instead of rule-following Christians? So some might say, well, you know, you people are trying to be saved by following rules instead of grace. You're missing the big picture. You're trying to live under the old covenant instead of the new covenant of Christ by your emphasis on commands. Well, as we've already seen, Christ himself said he has commands his followers are expected to strive to obey. Following commands is not in opposition to loving God. According to Christ, they're the explanation of how to show love to him. That's why Jesus says if we love him, we'll keep his commands. So we can't focus on the verses we like in the Bible and ignore the rest and still think we're followers of Christ. A fellow actually wrote a book once, Juan Carlos Ortiz. The name of the book was Disciple. I believe he's in Argentina. <laughs> he said, go through the Gospels and look at everything you underlined in it, in the Gospels, that you like. He said, that's the fifth Gospel, the things you like. He said, now go read the rest of it and pay attention to that, because that's what you need to be paying attention to, because you've been ignoring it. So he's saying, we can easily focus on a verse we like to the point we're ignoring other verses that maybe give more clarification of things we need to be paying attention to. Here's another question someone might could ask. Well, aren't all of a Christian's sins covered by grace? Well, the answer is yes. As long as we continue to love Christ and follow him with sincere hearts, struggle against sin, and repent of any way we see we're off track spiritually. That's the definition of walking in the light. That yes becomes no. That yes that are all of a Christian's sins covered by grace becomes no if we quit believing in Christ Stop loving and being committed to him, quit repenting, or cease striving to follow his commands and instead live consistent lives of sin. Although there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who fall away from Christ are no longer in Christ, and there is condemnation for them. So some look at that and they say, well, hey, I came to Christ, I was in Christ, so there's no condemnation. Well, if you're still in Christ, but if you turned your back on them. If you're living a consistent life of sin, if you refuse to repent, well, you're no longer in Christ. And there is condemnation outside of Christ. A person who wavers in their love for Christ and chooses to consistently live in sin and does not repent will at some point break the covenant and fall away from Christ and his blessings. That's the definition of walking in darkness. While all sins are sinful, they do not, not all represent the same degree of willful rebellion. Some things, like thoughts that fly into our heads, are often only temptations we should resist or ignore. 
If we begin to dwell on something that's ungodly or associated with the deeds of the flesh, our temptation at some point becomes sinful thinking. Actions represent a greater degree of rebellion towards God than thoughts, and they result in a higher level of consequences in this life. James talks about desire given into temptation and becoming sin, and then when sin is fully grown, it brings death. There is a point at which our commitment to Christ can waver to the degree that our consciences are no longer pricked, we no longer feel the need to repent, and we find it easy to rationalize sinful actions. In some cases, that's demonstrated in one major act of sinful defiance. In other manifestations, it becomes obvious in a pattern of activity over time. The exact point at which a person falls away is more obvious to us humans in some situations than others, although it's always clear to the Lord. All of these are manifestations of the underlying problem, which is a failure to love Christ and to be dedicated to Him. Until such a time that a person who's walking in darkness repents and is restored to Christ, they're severed from Christ, and their sins are no longer covered by grace. It's not that following Christ is this terribly shaky, undependable thing. Long, it's, it's like being married. As long as you love your spouse and you want to bless your spouse and follow your marriage covenants, well, then it's very unlikely anything's getting off track. But if you quit loving your spouse, if you quit caring about the vows you made, you see we enter into a, a much shakier situation. Then if you begin to break your marriage covenant, well, then there we are. But as long as a person loves Christ, they, they want to live for him. They want to be faithful to him. They're praying, reading the Bible every day, going to church, striving to follow him, repent when they get off track. Well, then you know, they're not in dangerous territory. It's, it's a very stable situation in Christ. So we've come to the end of this lesson. I want to go ahead and uh, turn off our recording, then we'll have some more questions.